Well, welcome to the More to Story podcast. And we are joined once again by another podcast. What podcast is that? Oh, stop. Come on. You know, it's you, you listen to it all the time. You listen multiple times per day. It's the Life Changing Discipleship podcast with Matt Friedemann. Well, Matt and I have both been reading the same book at the same time, and I was the one who secured the interview. I was able to lock it in way <laughs> ahead of time, and I decided to be generous and allow him to come in and be a part of this with me. So you're going to get it in just a second. But before we tell you who our guest is and what's going on, I just want to make sure you know they, both these podcasts are sponsored by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are training trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we do that through a variety of programs from bachelor's to master's degrees to doctoral degrees. We would love for you to think about coming to Wesley Biblical Seminary. And even if you're not interested in serving in pastoral leadership or one of those degrees, we have something else for you. And Matt's going to tell you about it too. It's called the Wesley. Institute. Yeah, it's a great program. Uh, we do two things. One is we take people through the year, uh, through the academic year, which is the kind of the semester basis, through the books of the Bible, 66 books of the Bible, and it's pretty rich stuff. And uh, we have a second program that is for theology. If you want to go deeper into the theology and all the dynamics of that, uh, that is a year's program as well. So you kind of got to choose one or the other, but it's rich stuff and people love it and lay people just are ignited by it. So we strongly encourage people to consider the Wesley Institute. And you can find out about more about both of these things, the academic programs at Wesley and the Wesley Institute at wbs.edu. Also, I want folks to know, I just had something that's come out just recently. It is a six-week study of the book of Jude called Contender. And this is a video-based curriculum that people can use in small groups, Sunday school classes, Wednesday night Bible studies. It has discussion guides, bonus content, but it's helping people realize the importance of how we respond when heresy is confronted, confronting us and the call to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So you can find out about that at Andy Miller the third, Andy Miller II.com. Matt's going to say something there. But I could brag on it because oh. uh, Andy is presenting this material at my church on um, Wednesday evenings and they're loving it. So, uh, in fact, the crowd is growing week by week. So, thanks, Andy, for uh, putting so much time and effort in studying Jude for us so we can glean your insights. Thank you. Well, thanks for saying so, Matt. It's been interesting, you know, that this study. Uh, in light of like what's happening in the United Methodist Church and global Methodism, several churches that are on the path towards becoming part of the global Methodist Church um, are using it. And that's a real encouragement to me. So I thank God for that. Okay, now on to the, the main reason we are all here. And that is, I am excited to talk to my friend, and we're excited to talk to our friend, I should say, Cricket Albertson. Cricket, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. This is a privilege. Now. Cricket, we're here to, be, to talk about a book that you have edited, and you've edited several pieces. Matt and I have both here. We're putting it on the screen. And I, before, like, before we talk about the content of this book, this is you've edited these books because you you have uh, done this work on behalf of your grandfather, who, as we say in my tradition, is promoted to glory. Nevertheless, like. You you have this unique kind of vocation with being this um, person who's helping some of his writing and, and sermons get out. Tell us a little bit about that side of your story before we get into the content. Sure. Okay. Well, I remember as, as a small child being at Christmas dinner with my whole entire family and all the aunts and uncles, and I was one of the older grandchildren. I remember I had theological questions. I was probably between nine and 12. And so we got to the end of the meal and I sat close to Papa and I remember asking him some of my questions. And I remember how intently he gave me his undivided attention. And then the table started to clear. People started to get up and do dishes. And I remember as a child thinking, how could they leave this conversation? Mm -hmm. Because what I loved about my grandfather was the ability to take our questions and the biblical truth and put them together. He was never afraid of the questions. The questions always provided an opportunity for more learning, more understanding, more growth. And he engaged with children. He engaged with anyone at any stage who was hungry to talk about it. And I just remember my shock that not everybody in the world or everybody even in my family wanted to sit and listen. Um, so that was kind of my first interest, right? That I kind of had a growing, I had a lot of questions. I probably more questions than most children. 
So um, after I got married and graduated from college, I, I was working as a secretary and, and a little bored. And so I thought I'm going to take a seminary class. Loved it and found myself caught up. I, I quit, quit my job and just went full time back to seminary. I graduated in 1999 and FAS approached me and said, we would like to get some of uh, your grandfather's work in print, and he's not, he's, he's speaking, he's researching, but he's not wanting to actually write things down. Would you be willing to, to come alongside as his theological assistant and help us get his writings in print? And so I started. Let me interrupt you real quick, Cricket. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry to do so. Yeah. Um, I want you to pick up right where you left yeah. off in a second. Yeah. So your grand, I didn't say it, your grandfather was Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, who served as president of Asbury University, three separate occasions, and then the founder of what you FAS, the Francis yes. Asbury Society, which if you fo follow this podcast, and if you're interested in the type of things Matt and I talked about, you probably should know who Dennis Kinlaw is. If you don't, we, we want to make sure you find out about him. So, okay. So F, you, you started working for FAS as his theological assistant. Okay. Sorry right. to interrupt you. No, 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 no. And thank you for, for clarifying. So, and the Francis Asbury Society, he started to really promote what holiness is and to send out evangelists in the churches. Um, his real hope was that young people would come on board and understand the, th the theology behind some of the experience. And so, um, so anyway, FAS hired me and I worked for him from then until he went to heaven in 2017. And really my mission was to help get his work um, written, not just, not just spoken, but also written to a larger audience. And then after he, as he was dying, then he entrusted me with the job to, to finish, right? To, we still had some projects in the works. And so um, he just said, I'd, I'd like for you to be responsible to finish this. So we've done things like we um, set up a, a Kinlaw Study Center at Asbury University. We started a Kinlaw podcast um, so that more people can hear his word. And it's not really, um, I mean, it is sweet because I'm his granddaughter, but I think it really is because of that understanding that um, the biblical word is big enough for for the for the culture of any day, right? And it, and the, we're, we don't have to be afraid. He was never afraid of the questions facing us. And as he went back to the word, um, then there were the answers began to unfold. And and I think that's what I'd like to share, even with the next generation, that we don't have to be afraid. And uh, God's word is big enough, and God meets us through His word. He's big enough to answer our questions. Hmm. What makes Dennis Kinlaw such a great communicator? Because Everyone says unbelievable. Now, and thank you, Cricket, for being that person that gets him into the written word, because I, I tell everybody all the time that, that we owe her a huge debt. Yes. Uh, and so I just want to thank you for that. But I just like to know what is there that has always made him someone that is, is so enjoyable to listen to, but so insightful. What is there about Dennis Kinlaw? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly, but what I, what I do think is he, he was so widely read. He was so intellectually curious. So he never became someone stuck in a rut. Um, he was always reading. I mean, until the last few days before he went to heaven, he was always trying to explore and push the next boundary. So he always had something fresh to say. And I, I think that's part of it. And then he loved people, right? So, so there was always this engagement with his audience. In fact, people, even as he was failing in health, people would come and he would gain new life, new intellectual curiosity by engaging with the people. And I think he communicated well because he, that people felt that they, they were seen and heard. He wasn't surprised by people's questions or issues or problems. Mm. Um, and then he had a way of making the word come alive. Um, and that was because of the amount of time I think he spent in the word. It, that mm. always was his go-to. So um, I, I'd wake up, he lived in our home for the last five years of his life. And I would get up early in the morning and come in and he, there he would be, he got, so he couldn't hold his Bible anymore. So we'd print off passages of scripture um, from, on pages. Um, and so that, he, that it wasn't heavy. And so then, you know, he would be there working his way through it. So I think, I think those three things are probably what helped him communicate. One of my favorite Ken Law lines was, and he'd say this every decade, I'm so glad I've lived past the age of 80 because the <laughs> things Jesus, 
the things Jesus has taught me since I turned 80 has been so precious to me. So I just love that. And that, that speaks to the intellectual curiosity you just yes. mentioned to the day he died. I mean, it's, it's the brilliant stuff. Yeah. I want to tell you my favorite thing about him, uh, Cricket, yeah. is he's yeah. both left-brained and right-brained strong. Mm. So yeah. left brain is, here's the good data, here's the biblical insight, but he's always got a great story, a great insight, and even the language he makes come alive with the right side of my brain. I, I just appreciate that about him. Yeah, absolutely. There was a creativity and an ability to, an ability to take really academic um issues and then and then talk about them in the way that a lay person could understand or a child can understand i mean that's what drew me in right i was asking what i thought were big questions probably they weren't but he could take real um theological answers and make them tell them in such a way that a child was mesmerized i remember leaving his house and thinking oh the world is bigger and brighter wow. Wow. and i thought that is what i think became i thought those are the kind of leaders we need, right? So they inspire in a child or in a young person or in a college student, like, oh, God's at work and, and, and his world is beautiful and it's good and he's in control. And so there was never anything but, um, there was never anything but a hope that was, was built in his trust in Jesus. So. I loved, I started to note how many times he would say these type of things just in this book that you have that we're going to talk about in a minute. But I remember listening to him and talking to him and seeing his genuine curiosity. You know, you and I were talking before we got on here about the importance of like looking at life as an adventure. But he would, he'll say, for instance, like on page 44, it's, he says this, it's so interesting to me, or I, I never saw this before. And, yes. and maybe even maybe he even a little bit of a I, I, the Ken Law laugh that would come up like it's a little bit of a giggle. And then you realize th here's a person that has been in like I've heard his name my whole life, like mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Like to me, there was no difference between William Booth, John Wesley, C.S. Lewis and Ken Law. They were all <laughs> the same level, like as much as my dad used him in his own preaching. So but 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 then when I got to be around him, he's like he would say things it's so interesting to me, or I find it interesting. Uh, I never saw this before. That's that curiosity and it spanned disciplines, Cricket. This is what's interesting to me is you know, he's an Old Testament scholar, but yet definitely interested in philosophy, anthropology. I mean, this is a part of his intellectual curiosity. It's so funny. We gave a, some of his library to the to the university and they they came back to us and they laughed. They said, this is the most unusual library we've ever seen, especially <laughs> for a theologian or a biblical scholar. Right. Because he read everything from literature. He read all the disciplines. And then when he met someone who was very um, skilled in their discipline, he wanted to know. So there was kind of this expanding curiosity. So um in fact, I have some physics books on my shelf, right? For a while, he was really, really wanting to understand science, really wanting to understand physics. So, and then he would try to talk to us about it and we didn't always understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this book, yeah. I, I, and I have to, I didn't realize what it was gonna be. It's called Holy Happiness, a study of Genesis one through three. Tell us about where this comes from. Okay, the first time I, I think the first time he gave these series, this was a series of five lectures that he gave at Seattle Pacific University in 1973. Then he also gave it at Asbury Theological Seminary and Asbury College, now University. And he may have given it other places. Those are the ones I know of. It was when I when I came across it in his papers, it was a manuscript. So most of what I take is from his speaking, but this was an actual manuscript. I think he wanted this to be published. Mm, okay. um, he felt he felt his whole life that Genesis one to three was pivotal. And if we didn't understand it, we were going to miss out on all the rest of the story. So, in fact, I have probably 200 more pages he's written about Genesis, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, especially at the end of his life. Um, so he he never got away from Genesis one, two and three. So, wow, this is interesting. Like in, in the front of the book is endorsed or people are talking about who heard these addresses uh, yes. in 1973. My parents would have been there as well. But honestly, I feel like this. When I read this book, I, I'm going in slowly through. Mm -hmm. I'm doing three or four pages at a time. I could read, I think I could read all in a couple hours. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like he was at the height of his intellectual powers when, when this was written because it's bringing in all these disciplines and the, per, the way it prophetically anticipates the problems of our time. 
oh my goodness, Cricket, I'm blown away by it. It, it, it is very interesting. And I think that's why that Genesis one, two, and three, he, he did have the ability to kind of see where if we take this intellectual stand, where we're going to end up, or if we take this theological approach, this is where we're going to go. So he was talking and that's why his interest in personhood, some of the issues that we're facing now, he did anticipate. I don't think he anticipated them exactly how they played out, but he did anticipate them and knew what the theological issues were Underpin, underpinning that and um, that's what he wanted to handle mm-hmm. so. i want to um there, let's just start the, in the book all together here matt okay. how about you and i go back and forth i'll get i'll get another question in and then you come next we didn't exactly plan this out but i i didn't want i didn't want to get in the way of matt either because that's a dangerous that's a dangerous <laughs> So the, one of the things I, I found interesting, and, and, and those who haven't seen it too, there's other books that Dr. Kinlaw has, uh, has done. One that I found really helpful that John Oswald edited is Lectures in Old Testament Theology. And he talks about this there as well, but the distinction that's needed in the I-thou relationship. Why was that so important? And why does he see that as a key move that's made in Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Well, I... I think that that this was always such a focus to him that we keep the personal relatedness that we are persons made in the image of a personal God, a tri-personal God. So it can never become an abstraction. Our relationship can never become a, a third person relationship. As soon as we start talking about God, whether in theology or preaching, as soon as he becomes an abstract, we've lost it. And I think that's what he felt happened in the garden. And so how to keep the personal presence of Christ always um, as the pivot for, for followers of Jesus. So never defending the faith, never just simply presenting the gospel. Always are we living um, personally face to face with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I think, was the essence for him that he never wanted, no matter how academic we became, he became, he never wanted to get away with the personal presence of Christ. Hmm. We're talking about Dennis Kinlaw's book, uh, Holy Happiness, a study of Genesis 1 to 3, edited by his granddaughter, Cricket Albertson. And Cricket, one of the things that's interesting to me here is the title of the book. If I'm thinking now, I'm just thinking here, if I'm going to name a book after Genesis 1 to 3, Holy Happiness is right. not what's going to be immediately evident <laughs> to my brain. So tell me about that. What, what, what's okay. going on here? It's his phrase. He he uses it in this manuscript. So this was his phrase. I wouldn't have been brave enough to do it, but it does fit. <laughs> I'll tell you why. He believed holiness was what we were created for, right? Holiness is what, so the, ha- and he also believed that is, that is creatures, right? There's this sense of the goodness of creation. So the world is not, in Papa's mind, it, the world was not evil and going to hell, there was this sense of God created a good world. And mm-hmm. if, if, if we, if we were who God wanted us to be, there would be a beauty and a completeness and a happiness. So I think both of those things kind of the tell us of what we were created for, we were made to be in God himself and God was made and God created us to live in us. He created us that big. And that is happiness, <laughs> that so, union is is what we were made for so that wholeness i think i'll just read a so, sentence here from from uh the dennis kinlaw uh, tome here the the climax of the whole creation is so that god and man and woman could meet each other every afternoon in the cool of the day yes. i love that truth he says the climax of creation is fellowship and communion together with god that's just beautiful stuff and i'm not and I think- sure I and I think I he would see. say that's happiness. I think that's what he uh, would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's yeah. the next line. That's holy happiness. That's happy that's holiness. Awesome. Yeah, beautiful stuff. And then I think he would say, I did debate. Do I say happy holiness or do I say holy happiness? Mm. And I went with holy happiness because um, because I believe that that he saw this kind of wholeness to the human life. It was not just a spirituality. It was not just a spiritual something that God wanted to do in us. It was the whole um, incarnational life of God dwelling in us and us becoming who he created us to be. So mm-hmm. that was kind of my I'm call. I'm sure that uh, Matt Friedman and Andy Miller would never do this from a pulpit. 
Well, we probably have. And that is like, it's a great line to say, God doesn't want you happy. He wants you holy. Right. But, and this <laughs> flips that on its head. Yeah. Well, and John Wesley had a famous phrase that way, didn't he? I mean, he's, it was Wesley that said, if you want to know what it's like to be holy, it's happiness. If you want to, I mean, that was a, that was a Wesleyan yeah. line. Yes. But what I love about that is pretty much what it means is holiness is the abundant life. Yeah. And I think that's what he, uh, Dennis Kennell points out in these uh, first couple of chapters of Genesis is this is the way it was meant to be. And this is the life of abundance, which is a lot of, there's a lot of fasting uh, things about that cricket, because what it means is things like work. Mm -hmm. You're yes. working. Yes. It's yes. important to remember your working is abundance. That is the abundant life. That is the happy life. That is the holy life. And I love what he does with that in the book, uh, just on the, on the point of work. Yes. yes. I love the, in the, on the point of work where he comes in and I, this is the type of thing that uh, your grandfather did and you brought it to us. It saved me a decade of thinking. <laughs> and, uh. and, like, I, I think it would have taken me a long time to draw the connection between sin and inertia. So on page 48, uh -huh. he, you, he, I say you and cricket. I mean, I can't help, but think like you're, you're kind of helping bring this whole law. Like you're, you're <laughs> birthing this process and I, I appreciate. It. So like he's, he says, inertia is my problem and yours. It's the universal human problem that keeps us satisfied with doing less and with the status quo, rather than pushing forward and working hard to explore and claim new territory. That, that's yeah. a part of this call to happiness, right? Cricket. Yes, absolutely. Because I think he believed he believed in order to be a whole person, right? In or, is to do the work that God has created us to do. And happiness comes when we're when we're rel rightly really related to him and then when we're doing what he's asked us to do or, or or created us to do. That's when fulfillment comes. You know his his vision of heaven was and as he got older he said, "Now, this is what I want to happen. I just want to be sitting at I just want to wake up uh, in heaven and be sitting at my desk with all my books behind me. And I want Jesus to just come and tap me on the shoulder and say, get to work, Dennis, there's more to do. Amen. And that, that was his vision of heaven, that there would be work to do even in heaven, more things to discover, more things to learn, more things to know about God. And, uh, so always, always, that was a driving force for him. Mm. It's hard to read Kinlaw and not realize or not feel, and I think you've already articulated it with just in your personal relationship with him, Cricket, just how special you are, you know, mm. that I am special in the kingdom. It's not a matter of self-worth or self-esteem or I love me. It's just a matter of God meant me to be special. And I love what he does with uh, Psalm 8 with that in particular. Yes. Uh, it, that's kind of a, Cricket, help me out here, but I think that's kind of a special gift that he has. You hear him, you read him, you think, you feel like I'm special yes. because of God, I'm special. And he, he had a beautiful confidence in God's love for him. And he believed that that was how everybody felt about God. <laughs> I mean, or how everybody, he, he wanted everybody to have that. He sensed this, he, I think he sensed God's pleasure. And I, I think he wanted to communicate that to every person. God is pleased. God is delighted in you. And uh, God made you for a purpose. And I do think that's why people would come and want to kind of, be with him, right? Because all our disordered views of God, um, he he kind of, and that's that's what he says. And let's start with Jesus, right? He says, if your view of God is wrong, your theology is going to be wrong all the way down, and then how you practice it. And uh, I think he believed God was a God of love, a Father heart, um, and that we were safe in His presence, safe to think, safe to explore, safe to relate, safe to keep growing. We weren't having to defend ourselves. Um, so that uh, if there was anything, I think if we could communicate right to the next generation is that God is, he loves us pro nobis, right? That's what he would always say. He's for us. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. I'm curious. One, one of the things I love, of course, this whole work thing, I want to get back to that in just a minute is yeah. of course he was the, he was the president of a liberal arts college Yes, and uh, he believed in the liberal arts, but one of the reasons he believed in it so much is we're not just created to go into the ministry as we sometimes think of it. Like we all have to be missionaries or I have to be preachers. If you're going to go out there and uh, be a widget maker, whatever the widget is, if you're going to go out, you need to do it with God. You need to do it as a ministry and you need to be full of the spirit in order to do it well. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 
Absolutely. So some of his best stories are about people trying to be ministers when they were made to be something else and, you know, forever frustration. Or um, so he said, sometimes God, God calls us to be full of himself. And he talked about his own calling was not to ministry. His calling was to God himself. And then God was free to put him in whatever he wanted to do, whether it was administration or education or pastoral work, or whatever it was, there was a freedom because the calling was to God himself. And he never veered from that, which then helped him in old age, right? It wasn't like, well, my work is done, right? Right. The work was always ongoing because it was to God himself. Mm, so. Beautiful. Yeah. Great stuff. This distinction that's made, um, you know, starts with the idea that comes from the way Genesis is framed. Did he take much of a position on rather like what the nature of this literature was? Was this historical or that type of thing? I mean, obviously it's a key question. Yeah, so it's really, I, I do think this is interesting. He was interested in science, but he did not believe Genesis 1 to 3 was science. And so the way he approached, he did not handle those questions. What he thought in his own mind um, and how he wrestled it through, he did not articulate. And I think part of it was he believed Genesis 1 to 3 was written to teach us about God about who we are and how we relate to God and then what has caused the rupture in that relationship. And I think he felt that the science questions distracted us from what really mattered. He loved science. He was interested in science, but it was a separate thing for, for him from Genesis 1 to 3. I think he felt that's not why it was written for us. Um, it was written for us to understand who God was. So he was, you could never pin him down on exactly how he thought <laughs> on, on the creation evolution debate or on the six day earth debate, or he, he, he didn't really want to engage there. Yeah. But he didn't give up on the historicity no. of Genesis, right. did he? No, I never, that, never. Not a science volume, but it's not an anti-history volume either. No, no. And he, no, right. Always. So um, I think he left room for there to be some, um, I, I think he just didn't want to be dogmatic on how it actually worked out, the logistics of how it all, all actually happened. But I think he, uh, and, I mean, and I do remember him telling me, you know, Cricket, between the, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you have more time actual time span than in the whole rest of, of creation as we know it, right? So, um, or for, from then till now. So he said, you, you have to just be careful how you handle the, the, the history and the science behind it. But uh, as far as a real Adam and Eve and a real historical story, he never veered from that. Mm. Right. One of the things that's mentioned uh, here is, and I love Ken Law on marriage. Uh, so there you go. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And I just, I want you to kind of fill in some gaps for us here. He says that God's a great school teacher. And pedagogically, one of the greatest lessons, object lessons he has for us is man and woman in marriage. Talk to us a little bit about uh, Dennis Kennel on marriage. Yes, well, he he did, you know, he talks about these eternal patterns and he believes that this union indifference is a symbol um, of, of our, our, of the triune reality, right? There's, there's un difference in unity and, and there's the perfect unity, but difference, but also between our relatedness to God. So um, there's in the incarnation, you have God and man in one human being. So difference in unity, he believed was an eternal pattern. And he believed that a husband and wife mirrored that reality. So that is why he held always, you know, to uh, marriage between uh, one man and one woman for life. Because of that, he believed it was an eternal pattern. And I love in this book, he says that eternal pattern is going to last no matter what. It is an eternal pattern. Um, so that for him became kind of the, the beauty was in the difference. And then that it was an image uh, that we were made in, in, in God's image. So. And it's Beautiful. not that marriage itself lasts forever. He even highlights that, that, you know, it, it's always kind of a little sad to me to think I won't be married to Abby in eternity, but, but, the, but it's the pattern. Tell what is right. that pattern? Like the, is the unity and diversity. I think the unity and diversity that you could have one within oneness, there can be difference. Yes. And so you can come together with one that's not like you. And there can be a unity, a unity of heart, a unity of mind, a unity of love, a unity of purpose. 
And, uh, and he felt that was very, he, very Trinitarian, very incarnational. That's how God uh, revealed himself. And that's how God came um, to reveal himself to us in Jesus. So he felt marriage was based on that, that pattern. So I love and his always, line. And he was a little book that FAS published that, um, and, it, and I haven't seen other people say that, that, and it always strikes me, it doesn't quite fit in my framework. But once I start to process it, it makes more sense as family as pedagogy. Yes. Yeah. Right. He did because he, because, because the God is first of all, God, the father is first of all a father before there's any creation. So, you know, he believed that family was right in the heart of God. Um, and that is how he primarily, I mean, that was the first, the first way God revealed himself. And, um, and so then, and then in marriage as well, that, that mirroring of the difference in unity that then is creative and life-giving. And so he felt like that life-giving nature is, um, you know, that's how, that's what family is based on. So. So Genesis one to three finally has to wind its way to sin. And uh, yeah. of course he handles that marvelously, but it's interesting because he makes a big point in the book here. Uh, and the book, by the way, uh, is Holy Happiness study of Genesis one to three uh, written by Dennis Kinlaw. Uh, Ken Law says the arithmetic of the thing is just fascinating. You, you got a lot of time spent on a lot of story in Genesis. Look at all the time that's spent on Joseph, he yeah, says, right. but 13 verses for the temptation narrative. So what's a clue into the mind of Dennis Kinlaw on that? Why only 13 verses? I think he's got some reasoning to that, doesn't he? Yes. And, and do you know what? I'm going <laughs> to... That one is actually not front and center in my mind. So I have to think my way. I have to think about that one for a minute. Why well, he said. Let me throw me, it out. I, yeah, throw it out. I, I just preached a sermon on it. I preached on this yesterday. So yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, tell me what he said. <laughs> it's on page It's on page 74 there. But yeah, he just says, listen, it, uh, Joseph gets all these chapters at the end. And, and yeah, Joseph was pretty important. But what's more important than sin entering into the world? And he, he just kind of has some reasoning there. I think it's fascinating. Right. So one person, right, who is fully God's and his role in in human history, right, becomes pivotal. Um, is that is that what you're thinking? Well, just the, the 13 verses given to the temptation narrative. Yeah, that's it. You got yeah. you got the creation narrative in two chapters. You've got Joseph at the end of Genesis and 13 verse. Listen, that that's kind of impactful. Why only 13 verses? Yeah. And I think he makes a case if you get if you. So if I'm putting together the Bible, like anybody asked me, Andy, but if I'm putting together the Bible, I'm Man, putting a whole book Bible on together. that story. I'm, I'm giving <laughs> right. you a whole, I'm going to yeah. call it Lucifer or whatever. I'm going to call it because I'm fascinating. Everybody, and that's the problem. And that's yes. what the desk can say. That problem is, yes, yes. is the fascination that comes with, with that evil. topic. Yeah. If you give it more than 13 verses. Yes. Yeah. And he like, uh, I think he refers to Milton in Paradise Lost. He doesn't want to spend any more time yes. on on evil than, than, than God does. Right. So he wants, and that's why probably the Joseph story or some of those longer stories, one man who, who wholly follows the Lord is worth, um, is worth the time it takes to tell his story. Mm. So. Mm. Well, another area where I felt like, uh, I was saved a decade of thinking and, uh, Hey, I, I'm in, I'm in a, this autobiographical comment. I'm in this, this phase where what's going on in the United Methodist Church and emergence of the Global Methodist Church and even my own uh, connection with the Salvation Army as I've stepped out of Salvation Army officership last year, now serving here, is that I've, had, I've started to have a little more cynical view of institutions. And maybe I've been a little hard on them. And I certainly have. And those who follow my podcast might say I've been too hard. I don't know. But nevertheless, like I'm in, in this position and and I'm just struggling through that. And then I got hit in the face on page 56, where uh, he, he exposes this idea that, yeah, well, there's this anti-institutional emphasis that we all might have. But then he says that, don't forget that in Eden, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we have the foundation for institutions. These, he said, these institutions do not come out of memory, but out of the very necessities of human life. And so then he highlights three key institutions. And I know Matt's really passionate about these, but the home, the church, 
and the state. So there's this pre-political reality of highlighting these things. Talk to me about like the, the role of these institutions. We already hit a little bit with marriage, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. Well, I think they're I think they're based on the kingship of God, right? That he is he is king, the fatherhood of God, that he is family, and then the marriage supper of the Lamb incarnation, that wedding metaphor. So he did believe, but he did believe that God presents himself as Lord of all, as king of all. So there is the establishment of authority, there's the establishment of order, there's an establishment of work, there's the establishment of what it takes for life to happen together in community. And it's, it happens in the garden, um, which is, I think is very interesting. And then family and, and marriage come, come later. But um, yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful image, right? And that it's right there at the beginning. There has to be some order in how we live together under his rule. And where we first learned that order uh, is in the family, right? Right. And I think uh, Dennis Kinlaw says in another book, he says, that's where we learn that law, discipline, righteousness is not antithetical to love and compassion and to tenderness. Where we first learned that or where we first ought to learn it is from our life with mom and dad. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Right. He would tell that really good story about stealing a silver dollar from his dad <laughs> and uh, his dad brought home a silver dollar and he was showing it to him on his hand and and Papa took it and was looking at it and didn't want to give it back. And uh, and so his dad gave him a big a big lecture on property rights <laughs> that it wasn't his to take. <laughs> <laughs> but it was that kind of you could be loved 100 percent and yet taught what is right and good and true and, and in a safe context. Mm. So. Beautiful stuff. I yeah. use Andy. I use a lot of this Kinlaw data in my class in discipleship in the home, and particularly on uh, the whole marital stuff. So, cricket, this stuff has have been hugely invaluable to Wesley Biblical Seminary for decades. Yeah, Love that. Uh, it's just been beautiful. And just as a just a personal note here as well, Andy, uh, cricket, uh, her dad has been my main mentor in life, as well as uh, cricket's mother, Beth. Coppage, uh mentored my uh, my wife and so just wow. this huge thing it, it, this is very personal to me but what I what I love about this is it's it's just this data has impacted so many people across the years it's just beautiful stuff cricket thank you but uh, in large measure because of you you put it in yeah, a print thank so you, that cricket. lots of people could hear it see oh, it, read it. my joy this has been my joy. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful way that you're stewarding this legacy. And I think all of us would have probably wanted him to write more, maybe even write some uh, academically. But yeah. in God's time, like this is how this is working. Like, honestly, I, you could, you could not, he could not have imagined in 1973 when he presented these lectures how relevant they would be right. in 2022. You know, right. I mean, the type of things he's talking about, sexual differentiation, mm-hmm. gender, mm-hmm. Uh, human sexuality, the nature yes. of like us being able to find ourselves in relation to God. This is this is um, I feel like th- they probably couldn't have understood what this would mean for them when they heard it in 1970. No, no. I, yeah. You're right. And that's why I felt as I read it, I thought, oh, can this be published today? And then I thought, oh, this has to be published today. <laughs> Critical issues. Critical yeah. issues. Yeah. In and my I own do personal- think he- oh, go ahead, Cricket. Go ahead. Well, I think he loved this idea that he did not want to spend the time it would take to write or to even, but but what he did love doing was inspiring other young scholars, right? To t- to 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 build on what he had learned and then and then work in the scholarly fields. So um to that that was his biggest thrill. Yeah. My own personal side too is um my 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 grandfather when he came to Asbury was sent to the kitchen where the bakery where your grandfather was uh overseeing that maybe as a year or two older than my grandfather and then they had a lifelong friendship and my served on the board uh my grandfather stood on the board at Asbury University for several years. Then, but then I had my own uh, personal interaction where I have a, a, a cassette tape recording me with three hours with your papa. And oh. uh, it, it is uh, one of the treasures I have. My only thing is I'll never play it for anybody because I can't believe all the things that I said. <laughs> <laughs> I was so embarrassed around it. And he was so patient with me. So, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> There was this key moment I remember where I had um, 
he was he kind of came to a climax he's like if you want to know what holiness is there's this clear moment where yeah I'm like, oh i'm listening and he said if anyone should come after me let them and i wanted to show my new some stuff and so i said take up his cross and follow me and before i got the words out he was shaking his finger and then he po pointed it right in my chest i'll try and point it in my camera yeah and he said and i just can i can still feel it like hitting me he said deny himself andy deny himself like i skip deny himself and and, and such a key theme that yeah. is in, in the doctrine of uh that that he purported and and shared so often so yeah well, Cricket, thank you is there anything else you want to say about this book or um you know yeah. what i think i think that the the other thing i loved about this the lectures the way he handled suffering at the end i think i do love this idea that he doesn't let us escape the suffering. And when we fight against the suffering, we find ourselves fighting against him. But when we wrap our arms around the suffering he allows in our lives, it becomes redemptive. And I, I know that in my own life, it has helped me this idea. Of, I don't have to fight life. I don't have to fight the painful parts of life. I can embrace what God allows in our own stories. And then that becomes part of the redemption for someone else. And mm -hmm. even suffering becomes woven into um, his redemptive story. And uh, that personally, as well as, as it, well as intellectually, what do I do with the problem of suffering? That last chapter was very helpful for me. So well, anyway. I'm glad you said that because we didn't get we didn't get to that in this. Yeah, Matt, so do you have what, something else? No, add? just beautiful. Thank you, Cricket. Thanks for all your hard work on this. And uh, I, I love the Kinlaw legacy through your whole family. And uh, you have just, you have been, you have served the kingdom extremely well because of your work in the last couple of decades on the, these things. So thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you for sharing it with others. That makes me excited. Hey, listen, I am. I'm telling everybody, go, go get it, go get it, go get it. So <laughs> the book is Holy Happenings, a study of Genesis 1 to 3 and written by, well, it was spoken by Dennis Kinlaw. It's put down in a print by his beautiful granddaughter, Cricket Albertson. So thank you, Cricket, once again. Absolutely. And thank Cricket, you guys. we want to say to you, make sure I know, like, I love that you take your grandfather's thoughts, but I know you have some things you need to say too. <laughs> so we want to, okay. I, want, I want to see the, the book from Cricket. Now, okay, perfect. I'll keep working. <laughs> keep, keep that in mind. Secondly, uh, on the Mortis Story fans, those who are Check this out more. There, I always ask the question: Is there more to the story of cricket? What What is it that you don't get to talk about very often? What is What is there more to the cricket? Well, I'll tell you what's happening right now in my life. I have three three kids, and I've just moved three. We've all been living at home, and uh, so I've just within six weeks, I've moved. I've gone from a full house to an empty nest. Uh, ones in Savannah, ones in West Palm Beach, and ones in Washington D.C. So we've. Uh, so big life transitions, but uh, so there's lots going on in my story, but it's all good. That's good. So. Good. Awesome. Thanks, Cricket, for coming yeah. along. Absolutely. Thank you.